Hi, I'm Shada. I'm one of the co-designers on Looking Forward to Tomorrow, which is an event on at Manchester Central on 17th of July. The theme is the environment and I'm here to introduce a film where we interview young climate activists regarding how we can make the environment more sustainable. Hello everyone, my name is Emma Greenwood and I'm a youth MP and climate activist from Berry. I am very excited to be in Contact's Space One to host this conversation from Manchester International Festival and Contact's Looking Forward to Tomorrow. I am joined by three other brilliant climate activist campaigners from around the world. Debe Adeb Goulet, Dominion Adeb Goulet, Genesis Whitlock and Mitzi Janelle Tan. Before we start, I think we should get to know each other, so let's check out our at home introductions. Hi everyone, I am Mitzi Jo Tan, a 23-year-old full-time climate justice activist based in Metro Manila, Philippines. I organize with Youth Advocates for Climate Action Philippines, the Fridays for Future of my country, and with Fridays for Future International. My country is one of the most vulnerable countries in the world to the climate crisis. Growing up, I remember the typhoons just constantly banging on our doors and our windows. It was something that I was so familiar with, but I really became a climate activist in 2017 when I was able to meet with our indigenous leaders. And he was telling us about how they were being harassed and displaced and killed and militarized. And ever so simply, he shrugged and chuckled and said, that's why we have no choice but to fight back. And I realized then that he was right. I had to join the collective struggle for a better planet and for a better future. Hello, I am Adebule Debra. I'm a 13 year old climate activist living in Lagos, Nigeria. I am from the Esther Ocean Movement. I became involved in climate activism through my participation in the Summit for Empowerment Action and Leadership in June 2019, where I learned more about the environment. Thereafter, I resolved to become an advocate for the ocean and climate matters. Other activities I participate in as a climate activist are trip planting exercises, beach club exercise, um, upcycle and recycle drives, and I also sensitize my peers about climate change and the dangers and arms it can cause to our environment. Because climate activism is my passion, is my way of making my voice heard on behalf of my generation. Thank you. I am Adegbele Dominion. I'm 16 years old and I'm a member of Restore Ocean. Climate change is an issue that affects almost every Nigerian, but most people don't know about it. Sometimes we go out and you see that the weather, the weather is hotter than normal. This has affected a lot of people, but people don't take pay enough attention to it. I became passionate about climate change when I was able to join the Summit for Empowerment Action and Leadership organized by Earth to Ocean in June 2019. After this, I came back with the passion to tell more people about this issue as it is an urgent issue that requires urgent attention. Thank you. Hi, I'm Emma Greenwood, a 17-year-old youth voice and climate activist from Manchester in the UK. I'm currently in my first year at college and got involved in climate activism back in February 2019 when I attended the first ever Youth Strike for Climate in Manchester. Since then, with another group of amazing young people, I've been coordinating the strikes and I also joined the International Fridays for Future Digital Network, where I've got to work with young people from all around the world to help ensure governments take climate action. I originally got involved because of the threats I saw, I saw our local wildlife were under in Manchester and around the UK with the increase in moorland fires and flooding and then I also got to learn about many of the threats the Global South countries were under and this just empowered me more. I wanted to feel that even though I couldn't vote and still can't that I could take climate action and ensure that governments took action too. Um, I've managed to educate myself and so many other young people and adults alike about the threats the planet was under. Um, one of the best things for me was the September 2019 General Strike for Climate, which was adults and young people working together to create events all around the world that put pressure on governments to show this is how much we need climate action and this is how much everyone was supporting it. In Manchester, we had around five to 10,000 people, which was absolutely incredible to coordinate and incredible to be a part of. Hi everyone, my name is Jen Whitlock. I'm a climate justice activist from Antigua. Some of the organizations that I'm a part of include Climate Justice Antigua, Escasi Caribbean, and Re-Earth Initiative. I got involved with climate justice when I was about 15 years old. And the reason that I did that was because I felt that climate injustice encompassed all every social justice issue that I cared about. Um, and it was especially important for myself as a black and indigenous um, person 
on the front lines of the climate crisis um, to be able to meet other people from different backgrounds who are also on the front lines of the climate crisis and even connect with people who don't have access to understanding the weight of how the climate crisis impacts um, Black and Indigenous people. So I'm really looking forward to this conversation and this interview that we're going to have with other climate activists from around the world. I've met some of them and we've been able to build relationships. Um, and on my end, I want to continue to work on building relationships and building an ecosystem to really tackle some of the systemic issues that uh, cause climate injustice. Um, right now, I'm really passionate about learning more about ecosystem restoration, biocultural preservation. Um, and yeah, I really hope that you all have a great time at the festival um, and get to learn as much as I'm looking forward to learn. So I hope you all have an amazing day and amazing rest of your summer. Bye. That was amazing to see a snippet of everyone's life, especially the back, the nature in the background was amazing. Um, some things that stood out to me was Mitz's experience with the typhoons is something that I just don't think anyone in the UK can really empathise with. We kind of, we get one storm and it's hell breaks loose. So I think, I can't even imagine what it's like to deal with that. And obviously the first hand importance of tackling the climate crisis because of that. And because of people in the global south, like the Philippines, it's so important. Um, Genesis as well, you started at 15, which I think is incredible. Um, and the Eskazoo campaign, I've been following it for a while and it looks absolutely amazing. Um, and Debbie and Dominion, your work around education as well is fantastic. And I think it's something we all need to work on because the current education system just doesn't really encompass it. So helping to educate ourselves, but also friends and family, I think is really, really important. So thank you for that. And it's great to get to know everyone. Um, so I want to start off by taking, a, um, taking you each on a bit about why you felt coming towards climate activism. Um, so the first question I wanted to touch on was what motivated you to get involved in environmental activism? And what have you used to help educate yourselves on the climate crisis? Um, Mitzi, do you want to go first? So I kind of talked about it already a little in the video, but basically I grew up with the impact of the climate crisis, but then the way it was taught to us was very foreign and technical and would tell us about the melting ice caps and the rising emissions and global warming, but not about what we were already experiencing. And so it almost felt like the climate crisis wasn't happening to us, even if we were so we are so vulnerable to the climate crisis. Um, and then I got to talk to an indigenous leader of our land and he was able to tell us about their experiences, why it's so important to protect the planet and to really fight back and that we don't have a choice but to fight back. And that's when I actively started learning about the environment because I realized that I had to, as an activist, to know what I was campaigning about. Um, and that's how I really learned more about the climate crisis and the way I educated myself was I did start with the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Report 1.5 and was a doozy. So I wouldn't necessarily suggest that you start there also. Um, there are a lot of summaries about of this online now. And I just started asking more people around me um, what they thought about the climate crisis, what the climate crisis means, and just getting as many um, opinions and thoughts and voices on it as I can and not just like the science part of it but also the more important part of the education I would say is learning from the environmental defenders who are seeing the impact of the climate crisis really firsthand our farmers our fisher folk and indigenous peoples definitely I think first-hand voices are probably the most important and so often I think the media is quick to use ones of people that aren't necessarily the most directly affected, which might not be the most educated. Um, so yeah, I'd highly suggest that. Is there any way people you think could get in contact with their local fishermen and farmers and go about maybe making those connections? Well, the way we did it here was we went to the communities and we asked around and we started talking to people. And I guess it's really that. Um, we're lucky because here in the Philippines there are fisher or like fishers' rights organizations that you can connect with once you're there. But even if that's not the case, it's so easy to just go to the communities and just genuinely go there to learn and to 
find out what's happening. Usually they have campaigns already. Usually um, they're already fighting for something. And if you go there with an open heart and an open mind and asking them, how can we help support? And really just with that in mind, then they're going to accept you. And then when you develop that relationship a little bit more, then you can start talking about the climate crisis. But first, it really comes down to you going there and helping support their campaigns. And in a weird way, I think the climate crisis is something that unites us all. So it's sort of a topic of conversation that you can start with absolutely anyone because everyone's affected. So I think we need to try and break down the stigma around having conversations with people about the climate crisis because you don't need to have a degree. It's sort of your first hand experience. So I think going to communities and just speaking to them is definitely really valuable. Um, Genesis, would you like to go? Similarly to Mitzi, I grew up uh, witnessing the effects of the climate crisis and being that environmentalism was a value that was already in my family and passed down to me. Um, I always cared about the environment. So that's why when I moved to the U.S. for school, I got involved with climate activism or student climate activism. Um, and I became so hyper focused on what it is that I would say when I came up to the podium, when it was my turn to speak at different protests. Um, and it. So there was a point in time where I was like reading all of the different like UN reports and toolkits written by other climate activists and trying to be literate in um, climate science. But then uh, there was a point where I had to look within and realize that because I had already witnessed the impacts of climate change and I myself was a black and indigenous um, person who had been on the front lines of the climate crisis before and my family um, is still there. I started to have conversations with my grandmother and with my neighbors and with other people um, and other young people who I knew had experiences that they didn't necessarily have a platform to articulate. So um, stories have been one of the largest pieces of, um, I think, artifacts or like historical, uh, I think, yeah, just the biggest source of education for me because of all the like historical context um, that comes with people sharing their stories directly. That's amazing. It seems like a very white and Western view that education only happens in a classroom or via like papers, which in a sense just creates this huge class divide about who can accessibly become a climate activist, which isn't true at all, because I think communities hold so much power, as you and Mitzi have said, towards teaching us about kind of the climate crisis, especially indigenous groups who've lived off the land and have seen over the years the change that's happening. So yeah, that's that's amazing to hear about. Um, Dominion, wrong name. Okay, so um, my experience with climate change. Um, so climate change is something that affects us, I think, most times daily, especially when it rains. But um, I got to, I got more involved in climate activism when I was able to join the Air to Our Ocean in June 2019. Um, before this, I heard a lot about climate change because my mom is an environmentalist, so she walks um, around the coastal areas and she gets to hear the stories of people about how um, the, there are some, about the high tides and um, sometimes when it rains, in my own personal experience, it, there is floods all over the um, street. So sometimes when we have to go out or we have to go to school, we have to get carried on by our parents, sometimes on their backs and stuff like that. So um, I decided to get more involved in this because I saw that it's something that is going to keep on affecting each and every one of us. And I have to tell my friends and everybody about this issue. Completely. And again, there, there's the thing about storytelling within a community and learning, which I think is most accessible and also lived experience based one. There's only so much you can learn from papers, especially like the Paris Agreement and reading it. Yes, you can learn a bit. But again, as you've said, stories from local people and their lived experience is probably the most powerful. Um, does anyone know anywhere people maybe a can access those? Obviously, if we're based in the UK. Lived experience of climate crisis isn't necessarily something that people have easy access to firsthand because we're not the most affected. Are there any pages that people know of that um, people watching could check out? Um, I can go. I'm sure like our different national groups and organizing groups um, uh, talk about the situations in our country. So I'm going to start and um, plug Yaka Philippines, which is Y-A-C-A Philippines, which is the account of the Fridays for Future group here. And we also have Fridays for Future MAPA, which is 
um, most affected peoples and areas or the global south, but there are also a number of other groups. And a group that I like also right now is Survival International. They're on Instagram and Twitter, um, and they talk about indigenous rights and the climate um, and biodiversity. Um, those are the ones that are coming to my head right now, but there are a lot online, really. No, they all sound and amazing. I think the others probably have like something to say for that too. I was going to say, does anybody else have any local groups they'd like to plug or people should check out? I think Climate in Colour is based in the UK and they're really great at just um, providing like BIPOC perspectives from the UK and integrating, making sure that um, BIPOC voices are integrated into environmentalism in the UK. I think Choked Up UK is another one. That one is started by or Destiny. They are a climate, they're a black climate justice activists from the UK, and they specifically focus on how air pollution affects black communities uh, or by POC communities in South London. And so they have addressed like environmental racism, how that manifests in the UK. Debbie, do you want to go and share a bit about what you've done around in climate education? Yeah, sure. Um, I was motivated to become a climate activist when I joined the Summit for Empowerment Action, Action and Leadership, organized by Esther Ocean in June 2019. Thereafter, I resolved to become an advocate for the ocean and climate matters. Before that, I have had an experience with um, climate change. When I was just nine years old, I became asthmatic and had to go to the hospital several times. I had to be admitted in the hospital. I missed school a lot of times. And all this was due to air pollution in Nigeria. Um, many people use generators in their houses their compounds because of the um, unreliable light in Nigeria. So er almost every family had a generator in their house. So it caused a lot of problems for me when I was much younger. So this motivated me to fight for this, uh, for fight for climate justice, to to be an activist. I have enhanced, I've also enhanced my knowledge of climate change through the internet and through books, which my mom, who, who my mom who is an environmentalist brings home and I just like read them, learn more about climate change, facts, uh, yeah. That sounds perfect. And I, yeah, that, that first-hand experience around the effects of air pollution is something that we very rarely deal with in the UK. I know there was the case of um, Ella Kissy Deborah who died a few years ago as a result of air pollution. It was ruled last year. But again, I can't imagine what it's like in other countries where it's much more of an issue. So thank you for sharing that. We'll move on to the next question because time is escaping us. Um, we were going to we were wondering what are some of the current impacts on climate change where you live. I know this has been touched about a bit before, but I think it's really important that people within the UK see that there are other places, I suppose, around the world that are dealing with much more severe first-hand effects of the climate crisis. So I don't know if Genesis, you wanted to go and touch on your experience. I think one of the largest climate justice issues impacting um, the Caribbean is just fluctuating weather patterns um, and being having to recover from natural disasters, but then also make long-term plans for the future for sustainable development and climate mitigation. Um, so that makes it really difficult because we are, it's really difficult to plan for the future when you also have to deal with a natural disaster in that moment. Um, and so because of that, I think um, making sure that um, young people and young people in particular who are part of marginalized groups like uh, disabled communities, indigenous communities, um, communities that are from low income backgrounds in environmental decision making and are protected by the government when it comes to environmentalism. Um, yeah, I think just trying to create more of a structure that includes as many people as possible and that is like a regional approach so that we can solidify our message um, and actually make real sustainable plans for the future. Um, but yeah, I think that's sort of why trying to restore from colonialism is so important because so, that's the most, that's the easiest way that we can see, sort of see a common thread of where a lot of our issues came up and then be able to restore and then uh, work towards transformative justice and sustainable development and climate adaption and all the things that we need to see in the long term. A bit later, we've got a question, obviously, what Global North countries should be doing to tackle the climate crisis. And I think that links really well into the effects of colonialism 
on countries and how we need to work obviously to not only restore that but then also work towards sustainability which is something that global north countries host have the privilege of doing without having to recover um so that'd be great to speak about further a bit later um dominion do you want to add about your experience yeah so like i talked about before i talked about um flood so even today when i woke up like i have to go to school today and it rained today so um i kind of had to and get into this flood but i had to wait till it subsided so i was a bit late for school today so flooding is one of the biggest issue um because most times the drainages are blocked and apart from that also changing weather patterns sometimes you go out and it's really hot in lagos I mean, seriously hot, and I don't know, sometimes I feel like I don't want to go out again. So, um, yeah, these are the issues that we face in Lagos, Nigeria. I think it's really easy as well for people to forget that kind of natural disasters, or not even natural disasters, just general changing weather patterns can have an adverse effect on children's education, which has like such a big kind of like raindrop effect and everything else that happens. So I think in the UK, I think we just had the wettest May on record, um, which has been really strange. I think we've over the past few days, we've had like 30 degree heat. So that sort of really sporadic weather patterns isn't just a far off problem anymore. And I think that's the thing we have to remember in the UK that it isn't just something that global South countries are going, going to deal with or just something that we're experiencing now these sort of irregularities and things that I suppose are, are relevant to us as well, but you're feeling them way more than we are at the moment. Um, I wanted to, um, Debbie, have you got anything to add about your experience? Um, yeah, the current impact of climate change in my country has really been very, very alarming. The duration and intensity of rainfalls has increased, causing floodings in many places in Nigeria. And this flooding has become a breeding ground for mosquitoes and other parasites, which, which cause malaria for children and even adults. The temperatures have significantly risen since the 1980s, and climate projections for the coming decades reveal a significant increase in temperature all over, all over the ecological zones. So like everywhere is just going to be hot when I go out, everywhere is hot, I feel uncomfortable. The weather in Nigeria is no longer the same. Even when it's cold, like it's not just cold; it's like very cold. Every like the, the temperature has really changed in Nigeria. Droughts have, have also been come const, constant in Nigeria, and I expect that to continue in, in northern Nigeria. Lake Chad and other lakes in the country are drying up, and at, and at, and they are the risks of disappearing. We have low lying coast in Nigeria making us prone to flooding, and especially during the rainy season in coastal and riverine areas. The deaths in the coastal areas that are being dumped in, into the sea also contributes to sea level rises in Nigeria. No, and thank you, and thank you for sharing that. It's, yeah, the, the extremes that we're having at the moment, especially Global South countries, sound really difficult to deal with. And it's something that I don't think we can adapt to as quick as the climate is changing which is probably one of the most alarming things and to have to live with that, I can't imagine how difficult it is. So thank you for sharing. Mitzi, I know you touched on the typhoons in the Philippines a bit ago, but I don't know if you could tell us a bit more detail about what it's like living with that. Um, I guess I can, I, I can only say what Genesis has already said, really. Um, more than the extreme weather events, more than the typhoons and the, the, the um, droughts that we're experiencing, a lot of what makes us so vulnerable to the climate crisis is how we lack infrastructure, um, how we lack ways to adapt, how we lack ways to um, deal with the impacts of the climate crisis, mostly because of us still having to recover from colonialism or still being under neocolonialism. And so really the way to tackle the climate crisis, the way to um, achieve climate justice is to decolonize our cultures and to have our colonies and new colonies be liberated um, so that we aren't tied to um, the global north countries anymore. We're seeing how, um, you know, it's something so simple. Like, like I remember I was preparing for one of the, what was called the strongest typhoon of the year last year. 
Um, and my Global North friends were like, hey, Mitzi, um, go fill up your tub with water. And I'm like, well, I don't have a tub, one. Two is like, why would I fill up my tub with water? And they were like, so you have drinking water um, when you get trapped inside your house. And I'm like, my tap water isn't drinkable. That would be useless to me. And it's, it's these small things that people don't realize. It all adds up together. It's how our evacuation centers, our schools and churches and gyms. So they're not built to be evacuation centers. So when floods come, they also get flooded. The evacuation centers get flooded. And so it's all these things coming together. And a reason why we're not able to really develop and um, do these things, because a lot of our resources, a lot of our um, development actually goes into developing the global north because the global north is exploiting us and taking our um, resources, our riches. Yeah, and I can't imagine how COVID as well has affected that. I think I saw um, towards, I think it was the start of last year or maybe a, a bit into the pandemic that you had a typhoon and obviously the effects that that had on aid and things. Could you touch on that a bit? So at some point, one of the typhoons last year, we have about 20 per year. Um, there were around 23 last year. So one or two of them actually hit a few of the COVID testing centers. And so what happened was, um, it, this was in the rural areas, so there weren't a lot of COVID testing centers. And so now when people had to get tested for COVID, um, the, the samples had to go a lot farther than usual. And so they had to wait in quarantine more. And so the health systems got overloaded a lot more and a lot faster because people had to stay longer because of how the typhoons were doing it. And another thing is how you know, when there are typhoons, we're kind of used to helping each other out and going into relief operations because our government is not reliable and will not help our people. Um, so we do that. And we were like, how are we going to do this during a health pandemic where we're not allowed to be near each other? Um, and it's just this whole thing. And it's not just that. It's also just the emotional trauma of these typhoons and the climate crisis and not being able to comfort each other in the physical way um, there's also that, that, and that has with the COVID pandemic, and it's really just showing how, you know, with COVID, since we're on the topic, it's the same thing that's happening with the climate crisis, with the COVID vaccines, that the global North countries who um, are least vulnerable to whatever crisis, they're the ones who are getting all the, the, um, the vaccines they're the ones who are getting all the renewable energy there you know it's it's this, it's the same system and we really have to start seeing the similarities and not stop seeing the climate crisis as just an environmental issue but really a systemic issue and it links into everything as well obviously climate justice is social justice and i'm sure people watching have probably heard that phrase before because it's so intersectional as you said obviously the interlinks of covid and the climate crisis and the effects of natural disasters on the covid response nothing is isolated in that sense so everything that is happening has knock-on effects that run throughout society and around the world as well because nothing with globalization nothing no country exists on its own anymore so we have to i think stop thinking about it in such a, a an isolated nationalistic sort of attitude and think what we need to do on, on an international level and through global collaboration to try and tackle the climate crisis and obviously hearing all the stories around the natural disasters i think we can see that so thank you everyone for sharing um the next question we wanted to touch on was around what would you like to see, to see privileged global north countries do in order to work towards climate justice? So this links pretty perfectly into the decolonialisation aspects that we um, spoke about just a bit before. So I don't know if Dominion, you wanted to start about what you think global north countries should be doing? Yeah, so um, what I feel um, countries that are already affected by this climate issues, um, I guess they should advocate more about it because um we're advocating here but if people around the world are able to um know more about these issues and um know how um like feel i guess feel the way we also feel like no like just i guess they should speak more about these issues because um is a global, it's more of a global issue that I guess it might still come up in other places, maybe later or something like that. Yeah, so I think people should speak up more about these issues. 
conversation is so so important when it comes to tackling the climate crisis and um, Glasgow in the UK is set to hold COP26 at the end of this year obviously a Covid situation dependent um, but I'm hoping that will spark some conversations especially within the education system in the UK because at the moment I think one chapter at the end of my science textbook for my GCSEs was to do with climate change or anything like that and it had no perspective of global south countries or the actual impacts of climate change it was more of just the theory behind it and so conversation and going into that and even in just around the dinner table it doesn't need to be this really intense conversation but there's loads of stigma around it it can be casual conversations about what people can be doing in their everyday life to make changes and obviously to help global south and, and developing countries to adapt and kind of i suppose recover from colonialization as well as you've said um debbie do you want to go i would like to see um, privileged global lot countries I'd like them to reduce air pollution and greenhouse gas emission, reduce production of plastics, create awareness, and engage people in climate action. They should also create strong policies and laws that would help in curbing the impact of climate change so that they can set an example for other um, less privileged countries to take action on it. Yeah. Definitely, that's yeah, all very, very valuable. And I think this links into MITSI as well and the Standard Charter thing. So many of the UK's banks are some of the biggest fossil fuel polluters. So I think Barclays is the second worst bank. Um, it's the worst bank in Europe for fossil fuel polluting anyway. So that's a big way that I think the UK needs to step up in that sense. And it's something that people watching as well can look into and see where their banks are investing. And it's small changes like that that you can make as an individual that do have a much bigger impact than I think we see. Um, but also, as you said, systematic change and all of that is so important as well. So contacting MPs and joining organisations like all the amazing people um, who are on the panel today are a part of can be a huge change as well. So, um, Mitzi, I don't know if you wanted to touch on some of the standard charter work you've done as well. So, yeah, definitely. Um, standard Charter Bank is a UK bank which most people in the UK don't actually know of or have heard of because most of its market is in um, Asia and Africa, basically in MAPA or the Global South. Um, and most, and, and not most, sorry. It's the third largest UK fossil fuel bank actually next to Barclays and HSBC. And it's also the one that like with their CEO Bill Winters, they're calling him the most sustainable bank person. Um, and their slogan is literally hashtag here for good and here for good doesn't mean and they say here for good means being not being here for coal, yet they're the largest European coal bank since the Paris Agreement. So there's so much greenwashing involved. And I really what I think the standard chartered bank or decarbonize standard charter bank or clean up standard chartered um, campaign embodies is how the finance sector is something that us youth climate activists really need to look into more because the fossil fuel industries have a lifeline and that is the government that's supporting them and giving them subsidies and these banks are giving them um, loans and and um, financing they're just the destruction and so when we can cut off those lifelines then the fossil fuel industries will have a harder time to you know keep doing what they're doing because fossil fuel isn't um it's not even profitable anymore right so we really need to keep pushing for that and it also really shows how the system works how this global north UK bank gets all the profit, puts money into somewhere out, out away from them, and all the consequences of, of that profit and getting that money goes on the global south. So it's exactly like the embodiment of the system that we have, where money is poured into whatever um, the global north gets money, and then um, the global south has to deal with the consequences. And so that's I, for me, is like the bigger picture of the Standard Chartered campaign, how it represents that and how we really have to work together, Global North activists and Global South activists, to stop this system. It can't be just solidarity campaigns anymore. We have to lead it together, um, of course, honoring and making sure that we give the most premium to the most marginalized voices. Is there anything that people watching this, because as you said, it's a UK based bank, which I, yeah, before seeing it on your Instagram page, did not know at all. So is there anything that people watching this can do maybe to 
help maybe promote them to actually take action on their greenwashing and live up to it or to obviously help you in the work that you're doing? Talk about it because again, no one knows. Center Charter Bank has never faced a public campaign, unlike HSBC and Barclays. Um, so no one has, no one like their campaigns haven't been exposed before. If you are a Liverpool fan, um, they actually fund Liverpool, and so if you can try to talk to your fan mates or whatever, we're actually gearing up to do some work around that. Um, targeting the the Liverpool fan base to realize that the sport and the team that they love so much is being funded by this company that's destroying our future. And so there is no sport on a dead planet and stuff like that. Um, other things you can do is not just look at Standard Chartered Bank, but really all the banks that you guys have there, more or less there is a bank, like your banks will probably be funding some coal company um, in the Global South. So writing emails, writing letters, connecting with groups that are already campaigning against these things, um, that can be really, really helpful. Tapping into the football network of Manchester sounds like the perfect thing to do. Um, it's very strong. So yes, definitely. If people could go out and do that, it'd be amazing. Um, Genesis? I would say that it's about, I think, uh, some, I think I'm think i going to pick up from where um, Mitzi left off. Like even thinking about Liverpool, I think uh, in the Global North, I'm I'm sort of living the experience because um, I've had to be in the Global North for school. Um, there are so many options to make uh, climate denial is like a fully funded industry, you know, um, making sure that the climate crisis isn't, isn't visible and that we're not aware of it um, and that it's refined and sort of invisible and affecting people in the global south from far away. Um, it's, it's intentional, but it's very easy to tune out global south voices and maybe tokenize global south voices. Um, but I think people in the global north should do as much reflecting as they can to really understand how deeply climate injustice is embedded in their country and the privilege of not being able to see it visibly and experience it directly. Um, so I would say that uh, instead of centering, and, and even climate justice activists in the global north, instead of sort of centering um, anti-colonialism or anti-capitalism or anti um, fossil fueled in industry, also making an effort to be pro-Indigenous community, you know what I mean? Sort of centering the, um, the transformative justice aspect of it, you know what I mean? Uh, yeah. Instead of, the idea of climate justice isn't tearing, isn't really about violence, but it's really about reimagining and building systems that are about truly sustaining um, everybody in the world. So I think that people in the global north typically think like, climate justice is way harder to reach because you're like, well, what about my way of life? Now I can't even watch Liverpool, like darn these Global South people. Um, but I think if you characterize it as the fact that people in the Global South actually possess a lot of answers as to how you, it is possible to live um, and sustain ourselves without necessarily relying on the extraction and exploitation of people of color and other marginalized communities. So I would say that that's why biocultural preservation is really important for people to learn more about um, how you can work towards advocating for climate justice while simultaneously advocating for the protection um, of black and indigenous climate justice activists on the front lines, protecting our land and protecting our right to operate and sustain ourselves um, and live in a collective as opposed to this individualistic um, capitalist uh, uh, the capitalistic individualistic values that are embedded in the global north um, in the global south we typically rely on collective action and being able to utilize the earth and really sustaining ourselves so um, that's a lesson that i've been able to witness like the differences between living in both the global north global north for school and growing up in the global south that yeah that sounds like it'll offer a really unique perspective as well to see the two different systems and how they I suppose, yeah, differ from each other, but also contradict each other. And um, so, yeah, thank you for sharing that. That was amazing. Um, we've now got, we're onto the final little section now. And it was mainly around one thing that you've done where you felt empowered through your activism, um, or one way you felt you could make positive change because you're all part of such incredible groups like the Air for Seas or like the um, YACA in the Philippines. So is there anything that you've done where you felt empowered, like you could actually make a change and that people could also get involved in themselves to make change? 
Um, Mitzi, do you want to go first? I'm, I'm trying to think of specific moments, but um, something that empowers me, uh, I think it's a lot of moments. It's, it's the everyday moments of activism. I, I feel like a lot of people think that the best parts of activism are the protests or the mobilizations or the large strikes. But for me, it's, it's the everyday conversations with people, um, especially when you start to see people learning and changing. That, I think, is the best thing for me. Like when you have one person, usually related to white saviorism, um, <laughs> when you have um, white allies starting to realize and starting to be more intersectional, when you see people starting to realize that it's going to hurt as hell and we're going to be unlearning these as Genesis mentioned, capitalistic views of society forever. It's going to be something that we're going to have to constantly unlearn and be critical of not just white people, but everyone really. We have to be constantly critical of ourselves, but especially um, people of privilege. When you start seeing people understand that, understand and accept that it's going to hurt, it's normal that it hurts. So don't get upset when it hurts and just look for the truth in when you're being called out. That to me is so like empowering and it gives me so much hope. It reminds me that there that everything is possible because we're willing to change and we're willing to learn from each other and we're willing to work together. And when that happens, when we unite and our voices get stronger and we become more and more intersectional, then nothing is impossible. That sounds amazing. And I think in the UK, especially over the past four or five years, we've sort of gone from the climate crisis not really being spoken about in the mainstream media. If it was, it was quite niche and few and far between. Whereas I think the progression we've had to now where it's something that's spoken about probably every day on the news. There's some new climate finding or there's some new research being done or invention being done. And I think that in itself is empowering to see the change that can happen when people use the voice and through the striking, which is just one aspect, but also just the international pressure and the fact that it does actually make a change because it's so easy to dismiss it. But the first hand things that we're seeing where there just is this increase in conversation and the fact that things like this, like events like this are taking place in itself shows the power that it has. So if anybody's thinking of getting involved, you can see the true power that it has in just promoting conversations like this and enabling young people and, and adults alike from around the world to work together. So yeah, thank you for sharing that Mitzi. Um, Genesis. So I think what makes me feel the most empowered is when I act in alignment of the environment. Um, and I think I, I've also had to do, um, Mitzi said this earlier, and I think it's important to emphasize like unlearning and really trying to decondition and reimagine takes a lot of internal work. And so protests are always amazing, but I really like what makes me feel most empowered is when I notice like an internal shift in myself. Um, and I feel like I'm actually working in alignment of the environment that I was given. And I don't, and I'm not like, I'm actually learning from um, black and indigenous storytellers around me and I feel like I'm healing. Um, so yeah, when I connect with other um, people, I connect with black and indigenous and people of color all over the world through a climate justice activist on a weekly basis, just to keep myself sane. And when we talk and when we get to like when we get to send each other pictures of like what outside looks like and we get to enjoy that and we actually feel hopeful that in and of itself i think is um tackling climate injustice because not a lot of black and indigenous people have access to nature anymore and have the ability to just go outside um, and enjoy and reconnect with the land that way um, and I also just love like counteracting capitalist <laughs> norms when on some days when I don't really have to worry about going to work and I can just garden with my grandma and we can just tell stories um, and anybody can come in and anybody can have like extra fruits of fruits if they want to. Um, that always just feels nice to me. And there are very few moments when we get to do that now because of the pandemic and because Earth Day just passed and like working, um, like we have to maintain some sort of momentum but I would say that I'm really thankful to still be able to prioritize my culture and um, the cultural aspects that environmentalism brings out for me. That is sort of what like helps me sustain 
when work gets a bit like out of sorts. Um, but yeah. Your Sundays sound beautiful. Gardening and stories with grandma sounds like incredible. So yeah, I'd love to be a part of that, but that sounds amazing. And obviously, yeah, resisting the capitalist instincts and working on yourself internally is just as valuable as doing collective activism. Uh, so thank you for sharing that. Dominion. So what makes me feel most empowered is um, knowing that people are beginning to um, take action. I'm beginning to see young people like me um, trying to advocate for um, this issue because it's a global issue. It's, um, it's an urgent. I, I'm happy that I'm seeing people take action because it's not um, a future issue or anything. It's, an, it's something really urgent. So I'm happy that um, when I go out, sometimes I'm seeing people also doing the sim similar works to the same work that I'm doing. And it just makes me happy. Yeah. Thank you. And Debbie, do you want to go? Yeah. One moment where I um, always feel empowered is like what Dominiana said, when I see other young people like me taking action, they're not just like hearing about it. They are they are being proactive, not just like listening, not just watching their environment get ruined. And um, yeah. No, thank you. And yeah, thank you all for your contributions and your suggestions. And I really hope that this has been useful for everyone watching as well. And definitely go and check out the um, Instagrams and channels that Mitzi promoted at the start to help educate yourself and just simply open up conversations coming from this, whether you go home and you tell someone about that you saw this talk and what you took from it, that in itself can stimulate a really, really important conversation that can help with all the work that everyone on this panel is doing here. So yeah, thank you everyone. Um, and hopefully this is a conversation and thinking that the audience can continue in their own lives and following this chat. Um, so finally, we wanted to do um, a section on looking forward um, statements, which is all about looking for hope in the future and seeing what we can do better. Um, so I'm gonna kick it off and go looking forward to tomorrow. I hope that we can begin to work towards meaningful international collaboration to tackle the climate crisis. So every one of the panelists has their own um, looking forward to tomorrow statements. So um, Debbie, do you want to go with yours first? Yeah, sure. Looking forward to tomorrow, I hope to see a world free of any form of environmental pollution. Thank you. Dominion? Looking forward to tomorrow, I hope to see a world filled with, um, filled with cooperation where everybody, even the privileged ones, are able to identify with these issues of climate change. Genesis. Looking forward to tomorrow, I hope to see people from all aspects of life, regardless of their experience with climate, uh, climate injustice. I want to see people working as an ecosystem to dismantle systemic issues that cause climate injustice. Mitzi. Looking forward to tomorrow, I uh, hope that we will have a society that leaves no one behind. And to do that, it will need um, intersectionality and dismantling systems of injustice, as Genesis said, which all starts with decolonizing ourselves, our societies, our cultures, and our political systems, our economic systems. So yes, thank you again to our wonderful panelists. We've got um, Debbie and Dominion, Adeb Goulet, um, Genesis Whitlock and Mitzi Janelle Tan. Um, and thank you for being such an attentive audience. And we hope you enjoy the rest of your festival and that you enjoyed this conversation. It's been fantastic just to be involved in the group and be able to join Zoom sessions like weekly, be with like a whole group of eclectic people was really useful and just hearing everyone's ideas and what everyone cares about as well. So for me, it was like an additional 
community that I had available to me whilst we were in lockdown. This group, although, you know, since the start of the project, we've never had the chance to actually meet in real life. I feel like, as a group, it feels really supportive and very, it feels like a nice hug. Personally, the experience mostly has been about meeting new people and getting to hear people's different life experiences from all different age groups and different walks of life. It was great just to see like the energy in the room and all the ideas kind of like flowing and spinning around. What we're doing kind of feels like it's contributing to like a, a bigger thing and like actually making, having an impact. Everybody's brought something different, which has then maybe changed the way you thought about something or sparked a different idea. These themes, are, they're massive. They're so big and they, they've got so much, each one of them has got so much to unpack within itself. You see your ideas or your conversations or even your opinions sort of influ influence someone else's idea to, to, a, to a point where it actually becomes something tangible. I think that's really beautiful. They're both themes that are things that are really pressing issues that people need to take hold of. In a way to kind of avoid it being about like suffering and going down a darker route, it's like a focus on black joy for the quality one, which is really nice, I really like that. And then for the environmental one, I think that's just because it's something that affects everyone, it's happening all the time. That's one of the cool things about the event is it is relevant, but not in a extremely political way. But at the same time, you are, we are talking about things that like matter and are important. Ultimately, I just want people to have, have a good time and enjoy connecting with others. Ask loads of questions, be intrigued, be confused, because when you're confused, it means that you need to figure out what's what, and that's an, an amazing journey to go on. It's going to be so much opportunities for, for the people that uh, that come into the space that, that is being created to, to, to talk as well, which means that we're going to hear more new things and, 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 and experience, hopefully experience some of the things that the audiences will be experiencing for the first time as well. There's people out there who are willing to uh, support and guide and help and just because you don't know something about something that people are not going to be negative about that they're going to welcome you in and go well come here let me tell you a little bit more about it if you you share the problem and like break it down it can start to look much more solvable much more um yeah something that you can manage and deal with but like this just feels like everyone and it's like the first time i've been in a group like this where it's just like you get a scope of everyone different ages different like creeds, nationalities, it was just really cool, but yeah. The event which to us is sort of coming to an end, but for the people it's the starting point for them, they're going to um, take part in these things and it's going to be sort of a, yeah, set the ball rolling for them. I hope that the audience will take away knowledge, connections and action. Through my three words, um, you are heard. Listen, collaborate and create. Growth excitement and an opening. Inspiration, joy, hope. Energy, motivation, agency. Positivity, confidence and empowerment. So I'd say positivity, sense of empowerment. I mean the word listening. I don't know, I don't know what the active word of that is, but I want I think people will go away from it with the sense that they are open to listening a little bit more. I think it's more important just for people to feel like there's a kind of like collaborative air and the sort of unity and that we can kind of all face the future together to tackle these problems.